If you're a B2B business, a B2B tech company, or a B2B marketer, you're in the right place. Coming to you from Studio 26, this is the Interesting B2B Marketers Podcast. Bringing you interesting contemporary takes, industry tips, guest interviews, and true stories from B2B marketers in the trenches. Now, here's your host, Steve Goldhaber. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Interesting B2B Marketers. I'm your host, Steve. Welcome to Studio 26, where today we are joined by Jeremy Shear. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. All right. So cool. I'm excited today. Um, as the listeners know, we always start off with case studies, uh, and there's going to be a theme to today's case studies, which is all about podcasting. And yes, of course, this is very meta. We're doing a podcast about podcasting. But let's just let's just embrace it. Let's just go there. So yeah. uh, the first the first case study you're going to talk to us about has to do with a healthcare client that you've worked with. It's interesting, right? Like we think of healthcare as just very institutional, unapproachable. So I'm I'm curious as you walk us through this first case study of like how do you how do you break that mold in such a traditional category? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I should say that this client is a little unusual for us. Most of our clients are B2B businesses. And this healthcare provider is, you know, I guess you'd call it B2P, right? To patients yeah. primarily. But they also have some kind of B2B component in that they're, they're working with other physicians, cultivating referral partners and, and things like that, and attracting uh, physicians to come work at their business. So there is that, that component too. So anyway, when we first got in touch with this client, they had a couple things that they were trying to improve or kind of struggling with. One was patient education. I think all healthcare providers are interested in that in one form or another. You know, it can range anywhere from super old school, like you're sitting in the waiting room and there are some like pamphlets around <laughs> that look yeah. like they were, you know, designed in like 1972. And you're, you know, those are not super engaging. And if you go to a lot of uh, healthcare provider websites, a lot of them are like very text heavy and they might have really good information on whatever you're looking for, but you have to read through paragraphs and paragraphs of pretty dense text. And even if you're, you know, just looking to learn about who are these people, who are the physicians, uh, sometimes you'll see, you know, at least maybe a video, like a well-produced video of the physician introducing him or herself. But all too often, again, it's just a picture and some text where the person went to mm -hmm. medical school, their specialties, which really doesn't tell you much of anything. So anyway, this client was interested in doing something different, in reaching patients in a different way. and. So when we connected, we kind of pitched them, well, what about a podcast? You know, that's a way to not just have information that your patients can consume, but tell stories mm -hmm. and have an ongoing series where you're interviewing your physicians and having kind of in-depth conversations about them, who they are, you know, how they, how they got into doing what they do, why they care about it, and also the conditions that they treat. And, you know, kind of doing a bit of a deeper dive on those than you might get from just the, the website page about it. And I think even better, it's a discussion. And so you're not just kind of alone reading a bunch of paragraphs yep. on some disease or something that's very technical. You're hearing a, a physician talk about it in just kind of a normal way, you know, in a way that anybody could understand. And it's a discussion, so it can go in, in all kinds of interest, interesting directions and it's just more uh, engaging that way. So yeah. that's one problem that we help them solve. It's a, you know the the great thing about podcasting as a medium is that you know you're on a web page, you can skim information incredibly quickly. You know you you can say hey in five seconds I'm in or I'm out. Podcasting, I mean you you can fast forward, but you're not you're not really going to consume or see any of that content. So so it is a great medium where they just kind of you're listening. You I mean you can. After five minutes, you can bail and say, ah, this isn't for me, but it's, it's hard to get there quickly. Mm -hmm. What was there, you know, tell me about, I'm going to, I'm going to guess that when you pitched the idea, there was probably a little bit of hesitancy because it just, you don't think of podcasting and doctors one of the same. What, what was going through their mind when you pitched the idea? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, there's, all, there are always questions about, you know, ROI, how, how are we going to measure if this is working or not? And beyond the obvious, beyond just like the number of downloads, although 
that's a question too. You know, do we get that kind of data? What are the benchmarks for what success looks like? But but I, actually, it is we we always do point out that that's just one benchmark, and there are other ways to measure the success of a podcast. I think the other another big one was just the time that this was going to take. You know, yep. an already really overburdened small marketing team. How, how much commitment is this going to be on our end? <laughs> and you know, so we always try to reassure clients that, well, it would be a massive and overwhelming time commitment if you were doing this totally on your own. But the whole point of working with an agency like ours is that we'll do it for you. You know, well, you, you can do the fun part, which is be the host of the podcast and have the great conversations. We'll do everything else. All the yep. stuff that's not as fun, like booking the guests and the editing and all the planning and all that stuff. So, so time commitment, return on investment, the cost, of course, those are the main things. Those, are the, those yep. are the main concerns. How many in the group that you were working with? How many doctors did you, you know, did ultimately, or or did you just have like one main doctor interview different folks? How, what was the actual like flow of the show? So the host is actually the marketing director, and we did that deliberately because this is aimed at patients. So we thought having a host who's not a physician. Mm -hmm. could help the audience, help that particular audience relate a little bit more, you know, because this is someone who doesn't have all the, all the technical knowledge, you know? And so she can be kind of like an avatar for the average listener. And she interviews um, as many of the doctors at the practice who are willing to go on the show. And, you know, oh. so there are some repeat guests and so far it's been really good. I mean, a lot of these docs are, you know, pretty interesting people. That's not off. That's not always the case. Sometimes doctors, especially uh, surgeons, and 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 the the people that she's interviewing are like orthopedic surgeons for the most part. Okay. Sometimes these people are not so great at explaining what they do, or just don't have the patience for it, you know. But these folks are really good at it, and they've embraced it, and I think they they see a lot of value in this kind of way of engaging with patients. Yep, and it's so funny that getting to know doctors and their style. I, there's a great study about. Um, hospitals did a study. Of, they, they were trying to protect themselves legally, and they said, "Hey, mm -hmm. what are the what are the variables that drive a patient to sue a doctor? Is it technical performance? Is it pedigree?" Uh, and the study came back with interesting results. And they they had a they had a survey flag for like bedside manner. So like, mm -hmm. hey, was this a, was this doctor friendly, easy to work with, and the correlation that they found in the study was if they were really easy and really nice to work with, then the lawsuits went down, which, which mm. make, it makes no sense, right? Because you should be making that decision based upon, are they good at what they do? Not, are they a good conversationalist? Um, yeah. But I, but you know, I, I, that sort of makes sense to me. I mean, I guess it depends on what you're suing for, you know, yeah. it's a catastrophic thing. It's not going to matter, but all other things being equal if you feel like your doctor cares about you and it takes the time to get to know you a little bit and, and you get to know them, I think you're just much less likely to, to, you know, want to harm them or, or punish them with a yeah. lawsuit and a doctor that just doesn't seem to give a crap or, you know, treats you just like a cog in the machine, even if they're, they're, they provide good care. Well, you just, yeah. you know, you don't really know them. And so you're much, maybe much more likely to be like, well, yeah, let's sue them. You know, something went wrong. Someone has to pay. Might as well be yeah. that dude who never says hello to me or whatever. Yeah. So how long have you been doing the podcast for the client? And um, where, what are your kind of next steps? Where do you want to take it? We've been doing this podcast for how long? I think it's seven or eight months. So which in the world of podcasting is actually not that long. You know, this is something that takes a while to catch on and, and and really build. And we've taken this time to really get it into a good rhythm. And for the host who had never hosted a podcast before to kind of learn the ropes. If you've never hosted a podcast, a lot of it is just by doing it and then improving bit by bit. You know, we we provide a lot of coaching and sort of ep episode by episode feedback. But still, the only way to get better is really just to do it. So part of it is getting the host in a good groove, kind of help finding the voice and tone of the podcast that can take a little while. So now that that's pretty much established, we're actually planning now to start a second podcast featuring a particular doctor, a new guy that they're bringing in who uh, 
is um, does a lot of publicity and is really keen on marketing. So we're going to start a second podcast and we're going to start focusing not only on patients so much, but also on using the podcast as a way for this practice to develop better and stronger relationships with other physicians who can refer patients to them. And they'll, we'll do that primarily by inviting those physicians onto the show yep. to, uh, just to, to establish a relationship and, you know, folks who kind of know each other in the community a little bit, but have never really had the chance to sit down and talk at length. And so, uh, th- we're going to start branching out into that pretty soon. Yep. I, it's such a smart strategy when you, when you do a podcast to interview someone, uh, and the, I was joking about someone uh, or about this with someone and it's funny because it gets down to like, yeah, if you want to have a conversation with someone and you're recording a live podcast, it's very difficult for them to say, are we done? <laughs> Can we just stop this conversation? <laughs> it might get a little awkward. And I certainly don't want to intend to encourage holding, holding anyone hostage, right? Like if, if someone is, has a, a super evil agenda, then yeah, w- just <laughs> walk out on it. But it is, it is an interesting dynamic that it's, yeah, it's kind of like grabbing a cup of coffee. You're not going to you're not going to leave mm-hmm. halfway through the cup of coffee. Yeah, no, right. I mean, and in a way, it's maybe better, even better than having a cup of coffee or, or, or it's like having a cup of coffee with extra benefits. Yep. Namely, you're creating content together, you know. And so, I mean, I think personally I like conversation. You know, I like just being with other people and just having conversations and especially during the couple of years of COVID when we were all forcibly separated from each other. You know, I really came out of that. And when things loosened up, it really struck home to me like, God, I miss being able to be with people, you know, and just converse. Of course, did a lot of that through Zoom, but but uh, it's even better in person. And I, every single person that I've interviewed, and I've done like hundreds of interviews, even you know before I got into podcasting, but definitely since I've gotten into podcasting, sometimes people you invite on might be a little nervous, you know. But I find that once you start talking and getting into it, that nervousness just melts away, and it's people have fun. It's yep. it's fun to to have an opportunity just to talk and and chat and kind of see where things go, just like we're doing now. I mean, this, this yep. is an enjoyable thing for me. And I think it is for a lot of people. Awesome. Well, let's do this. Let's jump into case study number two. This is, we're moving away um, from healthcare. Now we're in the world of B2B tech. And uh, the, the challenge you're going to go over is what so many, so many B2B marketers face is how do I be more efficient at creating content? Mm-hmm. You know, like we all love the idea of content. But then when we get back to our desks and have to kind of bang it out, it's like, oh, my God, like, here we go again. So uh, interested to hear your your story about how they can do that more efficiently. Yeah. So this is a client that one of their big challenges was ex- exactly as you just described, a small marketing team. Uh, they And they have a vibrant community of users of their product. And they have a blog that's like pretty popular amongst uh, salespeople. Their, their product is kind of a CRM type product. They wanted to build on that. They're like, you know, it's all we can do just to stay on top of this blog. What else, what's the most efficient way to, to not just pump out a bunch of content, but content that's up to the level of what we're already doing in the blog. And so when we connected and um, so, so I guess it, podcasting was on their radar because they knew some other players in the space that were doing that, but they'd never done it before. So they, you know, when we first met with them, they just all, they just had some really basic questions about, you know, again, how much time is this going to take? What can we, when we record a podcast episode, what can we do with it? You know, besides just publishing the audio and that's where they really saw value. You know, how can you, what can you, what else can you do with a podcast? And well, the good news was that we had a pretty good answer for that was, which was, well, you can record audio and video at the same time. Uh, you can then produce the video in all kinds of interesting ways, long form videos, short form videos. You can transcribe the audio and turn it into all kinds of written content, blog posts, articles, and so on. Especially now with uh, all these AIs coming out, chat, chat GPT and such, it's even better because you can take a transcript and easily clean it up for like punctuation and mm-hmm. spelling and all that stuff. Uh, without too much, without having to do it by hand, without, you know, it just takes a few minutes really. And that was pretty appealing to them. And they were willing to give it a try at least. 
And now we're going on, um, coming up on just about a year, I think. And that's exactly what it's done for them. You know, they're, they're a little bit less focused on getting an X number of listeners for every episode. Yep. They're kind of letting that happen a bit more naturally, but they're really focused on the content and it's worked really well for them. It's allowed a small marketing team to not just create more content, but good content, even better content. And what I mean by that is that because it's an interview podcast, and so because every episode they're talking to a subject matter expert, and because it's a conversation, again, there's an element of surprise, an element of serendipity. You know, it's unscripted. Mm -hmm. yep. And so unlike, I don't know, say your average blog post, which is very carefully planned out, and it's rarely surprising. You know, you're rarely sort of <laughs> delighted when you read a blog post like, whoa, right. I didn't see that coming. In a conversation, you often are. And taking that and, and transcribing that, taking the copy and then turning it into an article or in a blog post can maintain at least some of that surprise because you do have that back and forth of not just not just sort of a, an anonymous writer, you know, writing this, but, but uh, two people kind of chopping it up you know, and, and throwing ideas around. And I think that's just better content, all things considered. Yeah, it is interesting. It, there is a level of, of authenticity and sure you can edit afterwards and clean up what, what you didn't like. Yeah. You do a blog post, what, you know, it's gotta be nine tips. It's either seven, nine or 10, 11 tips or something like that. So they do get yeah. very stale. And yeah, I, I think you're right. There is no, the authenticity that happens in a podcast, you can't plan it. Like certainly you can, you can say, I want to touch on these themes. There's a structure yeah. to it, but the actual content itself is, it's just way more authentic. And I think that's also after 10, 15 years of everyone creating content, it's, it's nice in that it, it is refreshing. Uh, we, you know, mm -hmm. we don't know what we're going to talk about in five minutes. So tell me about where are they at in there? Like, you know, every client tends to dissect, all right, we've been doing this for three months, six months. Where are they at in that decision of like, good idea, bad idea. And then where do they want to take it from here? Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is actually a, a good time to talk about that because they're typically, we have um, contracts for like a set number of episodes and they're up for renewal right now and they are renewing. And so it's, you know, a pretty good sign to me that things have been going well and they, and they want to keep going. They just had a big bit of a shakeup, like so many tech companies have, you know, some people have been let go. So there's, we're in a bit of a transition period to figure out who's going to be doing what from now on, on their end with the podcast. So we're, so actually right now hasn't been the best time for making a bunch of big new plans. Like let's take the podcast in this bold new direction. I think for now there, it's been working so well from the content generation standpoint that they really want to carry on with that. And but, but that being said, even though we don't have like a big plan to kind of evolve the podcast in some, you know, exciting way, every episode is a little bit of an evolution. You know, we're always striving to make each episode just a little bit better than the one before. Better conversation, more interesting, more dynamic, find better guests, you know, do slightly better prep to get better, more focused episode topics, stuff like that. That's good, interesting. So let's talk about that for a second, getting better guests that uh, easy, to, easy to say, mm -hmm. is it, is it you're screening more? Is it, you know, like, Hey, let's, let's do an audit of where this person has been at online. Meaning like if they've been on a podcast, let's listen to it, see if they're, mm -hmm. they're good. Cause there is an element of just people being on a podcast. Like some are great. They are entertaining. They are dynamic. So how do you, how do you do a better job of getting more interesting guests? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've been thinking about that a lot recently. There's no one answer to this. And you're right. You know, the guest is the big X factor. It's just someone that you, you know, you might have never met before. You do a prep call or maybe, you know, slightly, you know, but you just yep. don't exactly know what they're going to bring when all is said and done. So I think there are a few ways you can go about this. So one is good suggestion that you just made. If this person has been on other podcasts, check them out or go to other podcasts kind of in your space and see who have they had on. Listen to a bunch. And if you find a guest like, ooh, this person's really good. They're just dynamic and a good, good storyteller. Okay, well, they've kind of proven that they can do that. 
So you can, you can reach out and invite them onto your podcast and chances are they'll say yes. Cause they're the kind of person that likes to go on podcasts. Yep. Right. I also like to, I'll sometimes check out conferences and look at the lineup of speakers and try to find ones that are relevant to whatever podcast we're dealing with. And, uh, I like doing that because these are people who are already putting themselves out there mm-hmm. and have probably had some experience with presenting and being in front of kind of performing for yep. a crowd. You know, podcast is not exactly that, but still it is a performance, both on the part of the host and the guest. Y- you don't want it to be a very mannered performance. You know, you want it to be natural, but you are, it's a show, right? And yep. you want it to be entertaining. And so you want a kind of high level energy. And so I think finding people who, are already doing stuff like that in one form or another is a good way to go. Yep. A- a- another thing, and this is something I've been trying to put to, to emphasize much more just very recently is finding people with good stories to tell, because I think some of the most entertaining podcast content is storytelling. We, we always say that. And I think all B2B marketers kind of agree just generally like storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important. That's really good. But I'm not exactly sure what it means often. And it's pretty (laughs) rare that when I'm consuming like B2B content that I actually am riveted by like a tale, you know, like an actual really good story. It's so, you know, the the old cliche is kind of like, well, everyone has a story to tell. And that's probably true. But sometimes you have to dig for it. It's it's I find sometimes people have good stories to tell and they're not even aware of it. Or they think like, oh, that like who who would be interested in that? I'm like, well, I am. You know, and as the host, I'll I'll bring it out of you. You know, we can work together to actually pull out what's really interesting about that story. So finding people with good stories to tell, I don't I don't have any like one awesome way to do that. I think one way is whoever you're talking to, ask for it. Ask for stories. And yeah. what I mean by that is what is a story, right? It's the the classic kind of structure is a main character or group of characters who are trying to do something and there are all kinds of obstacles in their way and they have to overcome them and triumph in the end or not triumph in the end. Maybe it's tragic, maybe it's funny, you know, but I think that's in a very simplified way, kind of the basic structure of all stories. So you can ask for that stuff. You know, you're talking to someone and say, what's something that you've, what's a goal that you accomplished recently that you're really proud of? And they'll, everyone has something, right? Then you can work backward from there and say, okay, take me back to the beginning of the process of working toward that goal. Tell me that story of, first of all, why you wanted to do it in the first place. And, and, and let's, let's break this down step by step, you know? And I think that's one good way to to at least dig for stories. Not all of them are going to be as, as good as you hoped, but I think if you do that, you can often find some really good, uh, some really good tales that, you know, people are carrying around with them. And if you're good at digging for them and extracting them, then you can get some really good content. All right, cool. Let's go into, into story number three, our last story. And I'm, I'm passionate about this one because uh, it's about real estate. Mm-hmm. Selfishly, I've been, I've been renovating a home for the last eight months. So as a heads up for all the viewers out there, my background eventually will be changing into my new place. Uh, but I love real estate. Uh, maybe it's because I've watched too many episodes of Million Dollar Listing, <laughs> um, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm a loyal fan over the years. But anyway, give us the background on this one. Um, we're talking about, you know, how do you revive and and rebrand something that's a little tired? So take it away. Yeah, so, right. So, you know, some of the best prospects for us are B2B brands that have a podcast, but it's been dormant for a while. And that was the case with this client. They had a podcast that they'd run for a while. It had, I think, over 50 episodes. But for whatever variety of reasons, it had stopped publishing a few years ago. But it was still on their website. So they hadn't just completely abandoned the idea. So we got in touch. And I just simply asked them, like, hey, I've, you know, your podcast, I've listened to it. It's pretty good. Why'd you stop? And I don't remember the exact reasons, but it was mostly time. They just got busy with other things. And, you know, there was no one at the company. Or, or I think it's often, we, we often hear this, whoever at the company was in charge of it and doing it wasn't there anymore. So they lost that, you know, talent. 
and there was no one else who was willing to pick up the mantle and kind of run forward with it. So, and they just had other stuff going on. So they just kind of let it linger. And that's the problem that we help them solve, right? Like, hey, if we can step in and take over the production and we'll get your podcast up and running again. And they were willing to give it a shot. And we're about probably about six months into that process now. And it's gone really well. They have, uh, it's a co-hosted podcast and they have two guys there that are just work really well together. Like they both know the industry inside and out and they're, they're they know each other. So they have good rapport and they've worked together and, and have a lot of like inside baseball kind of stories. And when we relaunched this thing, almost right off the bat, they were getting really good engagement, like really good listener numbers. And I think they're good at marketing the show. And they just have a really like engaged audience for not just the podcast, but a lot of the content they put out. So, um, and one thing that's really cool that, that I've seen, because I'm on uh, a lot of the prep calls that we're doing with guests, and, and sometimes on the recordings too, although we have an engineer that typically runs those. But what I'm seeing is that the podcast is just providing an awesome opportunity for them to get to know people in the industry that they maybe have heard of and have always wanted to have a chance to sit down and chat, but it just never happened. That's what this is allowing them to do. And I'm seeing it happen in real time. It's just really cool. Even just during the prep calls, they're having these great discussions, throwing around ideas, and you can see in real time that relationship forming and connecting. And it probably is something that's going to last well beyond just the podcast interview. Because these are people who have everything in common. They've just never had the opportunity, really. They've just never naturally crossed paths in a way that's going to allow them to hang out in a kind of a relaxed way and talk shop a little bit. So they're getting great value from the relationships they're building and from the and uh, the audience that the podcast is uh, is creating or the audience that's building up around it. Yeah, and it's just going really well for them. It is fascinating that th there is nothing new about podcasting. It is just people talking and you just happen yeah. to, you know, capture audio or video. So it is interesting the ability for it to elevate relationship building. And and wh where do you think that comes from? Why is it such a like is it a flattery thing? Is it ooh, this person has person has an audience, so I'm going to be seen. What do you think drives people to to do it? So you mean if you, like like a guest, right? If a, a guest gets yeah. an invite to come on the podcast, right? Why do they do it? So I think that, well, well look, I think, you know, it's partly human nature. It uh, caresses the ego a bit to be, mm -hmm. to, to get that offer. Like, hey, would you like to be a featured guest on our podcast? Same when you reach out to me, you know, I, I'm, it's the same thing. I'm like, oh. Uh, well, first of all, that is a little bit flattering. You know, the first thing I do is, that anyone will do is go check out the podcast. And by the way, you do a really great job of with the marketing and just the outreach because you have like some really great graphics that explain all of what the podcast is about. And so kudos to you for doing that. I think that, that's a really good, really good idea. And um, but anyway, it's you, you go check out the podcast and you see like, oh, wow, they've had this many episodes and they've had these people on it, I, you know, even if I don't recognize any of the names, I see like, oh, they're marketing leaders at a wide variety of companies. They've talked about all this stuff. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's sort of flattering, like an honor to be thought of as belonging amongst this kind, these kind of people. Yep. And then also, of course, we're all, you know, a little uh, selfish, not in a bad way. It's just, it's your time, right? So you're like, all right, well, what am I going to get out of this if I devote an hour to, you know, doing this interview? Like, well, we're going to get some content out of it. There's going to be a podcast episode that's going to feature me and my voice and my face if it's video too, right? So that seems pretty good. And we'll get to talk about something I'm interested. And, you know, it's not every day I get, uh, I'm in a situation where someone's willing to, to listen to me talk yeah. <laughs> about the stuff that I want to talk about. You know, it, it's, it, it's uh, you don't often have that platform. So I think it's a very attractive proposition for most people. And I've, I've found that when I'm the host and I'm reaching out to guests as well. Yeah. So uh, here's the other thing too about the real estate story. I feel like the one thing about real estate agents that I know is they're in an office maybe an hour here, two hours there. And then mostly it's like they're on the road. They're working open mm -hmm. houses. They're, mm -hmm. 
they're going out and meeting with people. So it's, it is a great thing that you can listen into a car or, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's one of these mediums where, you know, it's not as fun to like get your laptop laptop out and watch something or do something, but it's kind of like, well, it's on my phone. It's there. I got 20 minutes to kill. Why not? So it, it, it yeah. lends itself to a lot of, a lot of gap filling in our crazy lives. Well, it's very convenient in that way. Right. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's when you're in your car or doing the dishes or walking the dog or, you know, around the park or, or whatever, it's pretty yeah. convenient. My own, this is kind of my, this is maybe a little too much information, but I'm, I'm now in this routine where I'll shave, let's call it two, sometimes three days a week. Mm -hmm. And it's like my own routine and I, I do a podcast and it's more, it, it, this is an adult podcast because my kids are sleeping and mm -hmm. it's kind of like that becomes my routine. All right, this is going to be a 15 minute thing. I'm going to put the, the podcast on and just, you know, it, it's, I've, I've filled time instead of just looking at my face in the mirror shaving, I'm now, you know, enjoying something in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do that too, actually. And you know what would be a what, what would be funny or a good idea if there was a podcast about shaving that yeah. you could listen to while shaving. <laughs> while you're shaving. Yeah, with like, you know, tips for how to get a smoother shave or something. <laughs> I like that. I yeah, man, a star is born today. Someone's going to someone's going <laughs> to hear this and take it and let's just right. at least buy the domain so we can take advantage of that. <laughs> All right, cool. So we're going to jump now into just getting to know more about you. Um I'm going to go way back in time. Like when was that first moment that you were like, you know what? I I like marketing. There's just something there about either helping sell something or making someone or a company look better than they are. Where, where did you kind of first start? Mm -hmm. Well, I first started about really seven years ago. And this was when for a long time I'd been a freelance writer. And which kind of morphed into learning also how to be like a freelance audio producer, producing stuff for radio, public radio and, and whatnot. But then I took a job as a copywriter at a medical device company. So kind of suddenly I found myself as part of a, a marketing team, a B2B marketing team. I had zero experience with all that. I had uh, actually never worked at just like a corporation you know, show up to the building, sit in the cubicle, that kind of thing. And so that was all new to me. And it was all really interesting. Uh, you know, the I, I, I wasn't even really aware of even the most basic things like B2B. What does that mean? Oh, business to business. Okay, right. And that's a very different kind of marketing than B2C. Oh, what's that? Business to consumer. Oh, okay, right. You know, I was starting really from scratch, but I learned I was there for five years I learned a lot about, you know, how B2B marketing works and also how it doesn't work, you know, or mistakes you can make. To be fair, medical device industry is highly regulated. Yep. And so it's really, it's a little frustrating if you're a content marketer, it really limits like what you can do and say and all that. But still, but there, that's also where I started to get the idea that podcasting could be an interesting marketing tool because the uh or at least an interesting communication tool because this company had a large sales force all over the world spending a lot of time on the road and they were actually literally asking for a podcast that, so they could learn from each other you know from the top sellers and like how, how do you close deals you know what do you do and i thought whoa that's what a great idea that that makes so much sense it had never occurred to me because i'd never worked at a company that had a big sales force you know and i was like oh cool i raised my hand i'll do it i'll volunteer i know how to do that stuff and i'll maybe i can build out like a whole podcast division at this company who knows you know what yeah. the future might bring long story short it never really happened company just never quite got behind it for a variety of reasons but the idea stuck with me and i'm like this is a good idea Certainly other companies might see value in this kind of thing. So I just started reaching out on places like LinkedIn, you know, like on, on in my own time. And it took a while, but I, I finally realized that actually the, the, there was the most interest in demand as podcasting as a marketing tool, not necessarily so much as an internal communications tool. I'm still a little surprised by that. I still think it's a good use case for like sales yeah. enablement or, or yeah. whatever. 
but it turned out that a lot of the people I were talking to were more interested in marketing for all the reasons that we've been talking about so far, creating content, connecting with people, and so on. And that's, that's really when I first started seriously looking into, okay, what, what is B2B marketing? What is B2B content marketing? How does it work? What are the main issues? And this was already like, I guess about five years ago, because I was like two, two years into that job and learned a lot, started, uh, started talking to people, started talking to marketers just to learn. And, but even in just the five years since then, things have changed a lot. And I feel like B2B content marketing is just always changing, always evolving. And so um, I just got really kind of fascinated by it, like uh, started participating in conversations on LinkedIn and thought, wow, this is a really interesting group of very smart people who are faced with a very challenging thing, namely getting B2B buyers to buy things, to buy your, and dealing with these long sales cycles and uh, trying to create content that's going to cut through the noise and engage people. I'm like, yeah, that's hard. That's hard to do. And, yep. and so it's, it, it was just really interesting to start having conversations with people about how do you do it? You know, what are the challenges? Yeah, I, I can really relate to that. I grew up in the BDC world. What I, you know, what I loved about the BDC world was decisions happen fast. May, you know, maybe if you're buying a car, that's, you may need two months to get there. Or I spent some time in the satellite business early on. And that was, you know, eh, it takes about three to four visits for someone to like commit to it. But the B2B world is just crazy. It is it is such a dynamic buying environment in that sometimes you don't even know all the buyers or the influencers. Um, right. You rarely understand all the context and the politics behind how a decision gets made. You know, it, it's like there's so many off the record things that you don't know. Like, well, this person has a good relationship here. I've even had stories of like, well, this person's on the board of that board and this shouldn't really, ha you know, nothing to do with how good your marketing or sales was. It just got to like, this isn't going to happen due to some other issues. And that, that rarely was the case in B2C. So I, I became fascinated with B2B in that it just, it's not easy to do. It, it's hard. Yeah. It's a longer process. Even people who aren't in charge sometimes proclaim to be in charge, you know, <laughs> like, they're mm, like, no, 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 yeah. no, no. I, I make these decisions. And then you find out like, no, you're not, you're just a facility. Like it, it's fascinating. The, the different dynamics at play. Yeah. It's, it's like this complex puzzle and the pieces are always sort of morphing and changing, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've definitely had a bunch of times when I thought, I thought that we, you know, had a, a closed deal even to the point where I'm like, okay, please send us the agreement. We'll get it signed. Okay, awesome. Let's get started. And then like a week goes by, I'm like, what's going on? They're like, oh yeah, no, sorry. We have to, we're going to postpone what happened. Sometimes I have no clue. Like you said, it's just, yeah. you don't know what's going on behind the curtain. Or sometimes it's as simple as like, oh, it's one, one person, one person left the company and it has this ripple effect. Yeah. That suddenly everything's changed <laughs> and it's not even the main decision maker. It's just like, well, now everything's changed. We have to figure it out and blah, blah, blah. And that can be pretty frustrating, but it's also such a challenge. You know, you wake up, wake up every day and I'm like, I almost feel like, all right, I'm going off to war. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this is a battle for the, for the attention of these people who are super duper busy. And I'm just one you know, measly vendor trying to get their attention. There are thousands of others who are pinging them and trying to do the same exact thing. And, you know, at least for me and part of my education on all this stuff, I'm like, it's a matter of timing. And no matter what I do, no matter how good my content is or how good my value proposition or pitch, ain't nobody going to buy from me unless until they are ready to buy, until the circumstances align yep. when it's almost like, they kind of don't have a choice anymore. They now is the time and they have to do it. And that's rarely has anything to do with something I've done or said, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's all about, and, and you can't time it like, like the stock market. You, you just don't know, despite all of the, in my opinion, anyway, despite all of the tech and software out there, that's kind of, you know, purports to be able to help you at least know a little bit better. And, and, you know, I'm sure 
a lot of that stuff can at least help you. But at the end of the day, you just have to be in front of these folks and stay top of mind without completely annoying them and trying to yep. sell them every single second. <laughs> and that's content marketing, right? I mean, that's why we're pumping out all this content and trying to stay top of mind. And um, it's a big challenge. And uh, it can be, it really can be frustrating, right? Because you don't always just see immediate returns all the time. At least I yep. don't. You know, I'm sure there are marketers who are much better than me. I mean, I know there are, but uh, I'm learning as I go. You know, so it's it's never never uh, never boring. I'll say that much. Yeah, it, it's I can relate to these challenges. I mean, I've done things. A marketer doing his own marketing is it good or bad? I I've had moments when I've done my marketing and and thought. My God, these these seventy people that I want to reach, they're they're just not engaging, and yeah. I, you can kind of say, well, are they consuming? Yeah, I think they are. The it looks like they're opening emails or they're clicking on links to websites. But every now and then, I will be re reaffirmed and and kind of does marketing work in a way that I want it to. Where I had a, a prospect I've been trying to engage with for two to three years, and you know send them all the content they're not really engaged in it and then out of the blue a phone call oh my mm. god a, a project came up and i instantly thought of you and then when mm. we had that conversation the person was like oh yeah I've, I've read all the blog posts i actually bought your book i read your book nice job mm. on the book and it just was like you you think that person is not engaged but it's like no they actually are engaged it's just not time to buy so it is such mm -hmm. a long-term game that you've got to play you know i i think there are people engage with content in different ways, right? Some people like the, I don't know, maybe call them like the super engagers, you know, they're going to comment on your blog post or on your LinkedIn post and just be, you know, very active that way. But I think those people are probably in the minority and it's the vast majority of people who might scroll through LinkedIn and they might see your stuff and read it and be like, hmm, cool, but not, not like it or it necessarily engaged for whatever reason. That's just not their thing, you know? So you just don't know. And I've had similar experiences where, yeah, out of the blue, someone will reach out and they'll be like, oh, I read your thing. And I'll be like, oh, really? I, okay, cool. That it, it yeah. does give you, it does, it's, it's nice to get that because it gives you some hope that like, ah, oh, this isn't just a total waste of time. I'm not just, you know, screaming into the void and no one cares. Yeah. So what you just shared, it reminds me of a really old content engagement model and the premise of it is one nine ninety. One percent of the people create, nine percent engage, and the remaining ninety percent are just there watching. Mm, and yeah. you never really understand the value of the ninety percent of the people they're watching, but they are. And and it, and it yeah. helps. Like the silent majority, you mm -hmm. know. And it's just it's good to know that. Although I will say, you know, as and and actually, like one thing I want to make clear is that. Like, I'm not really a professional marketer, you know, I'm a podcast producer and I run this business and by necessity, I do marketing because we have to, and, you know, we're a small startup. So w without like outside funding or anything. So a lot of this falls to me and I get help, you know, like, I don't know what I don't know, but still a, a lot of it is me doing this stuff. So I have just great respect for like actual real marketing leaders who run the run this kind of stuff for a company um and really admire what they do and feel you know kind of privileged to be able to have a podcast where i interview a lot of these folks and learn from them mm -hmm. so you know kind of getting a a crash course on it but because i'm doing it alone it can get just kind of lonely and it's hard to know sometimes really if like is this working yeah but so it's good to know that there's that 90 percent out there who are watching it's just sometimes in the moment, it's like, ugh, I really wish more people would engage. <laughs> yeah. Just give me a clue that you're out there, you know? Where do you see the world of podcasting going? I mean, it's it clearly been on a trajectory where it's easier to do, you know, it, it's not a mass medium channel, right? But like, it is, it is a thing that's here to stay. Where do you see it going? Yeah. Well... Um, I think it depends a little bit on what kind of podcasting you're talking about. So broadly, generally, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, just kind of consumer podcasting or podcasts built for just anyone who's interested, trying to build the, the largest audiences. 
it seem, I, I think podcasting will keep growing, even though it seems so ubiquitous still compared to like uh, even just radio. Way more people listen to regular good old radio than podcasts at this point. But year on year, a greater percentage of people are listening to podcasts and all around the world. I mean, I know the stats best for the United States, but there are many regions of the world where podcasting is growing even, even faster in, in not in English, in all kinds of languages, you know? So, so I think that's one realm where we might see some really interesting growth, podcasting around the world in, in a wide variety of languages. I think in the, the B2B podcasting space, that's a much smaller world and a very kind of niche world. And what my sense is that, first of all, there are more and more agencies like ours popping up all the time with offering pretty similar services. And so I think in the coming years, we're going to see some consolidation of these smaller companies like, like mine joining up. I think that we, I think it'll be interesting to see to what degree, if at all, we, we see the, in, the B2B podcasting industry kind of professionalize. And what I mean by that is in the, in the larger podcasting industry, it, it's, it really has professionalized a lot. There are annual conferences, there are many newsletters, organizations, and there's a lot of money in it. In the B2B world, because it's so much smaller, there really isn't much of that at all. But as more and more B2B companies take on podcasting, and I do think that's something we're going to see. I, I think uh, right now, it's I, I don't have... At one point, I think I read somewhere that maybe 20% of B2B companies have podcasts. I do not remember where I saw that or I have no idea how accurate that is. But just anecdotally, just from what I see, still most B2B companies don't have a podcast. But I think that's going to change. I think that uh, over the in the coming years, within maybe a decade or so, maybe less, uh, podcasts will be as common as blogs for B2B companies. And that will drive, I think, consolidation and professionalization in the B2B podcasting industry. And I'd also love to see one of, one of my kind of focuses this year, and, and it's really kind of a dream in a way, is to start producing different kinds of B2B podcasts. Right now, almost all of them are interview style, which is fine. There can be some really, really good interview podcasts, but I would love to see some more more highly produced storytelling podcasts, kind of like if you've ever, like like in the mold of, of This American Life or the podcast How I Built This with Guy Raz, which tells the stories of how entrepreneurs built their brands. And, and it's done in a, um, a much more dynamic way with sound effects and music and a narrator and snippets from the interview and maybe multiple voices, you know, more than just two, three, four voices coming in kind of like mini audio documentaries. I, and I, I do some of this kind of work, not for our B2B clients right now, but from, for some other clients we have, and it's really dynamic content. And I think that B2B brands could do well to really stand out with a podcast doing this kind of thing. It's more complicated, takes more time. It's a little more expensive if you're paying for it. But I think it could be worth it just to do something new and more yeah. dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Jeremy, I've really enjoyed getting to know you more and and really diving into the world of podcasting. You're, you're super knowledgeable about this. Uh, my final question would be, for someone out there who's in a B2B role, who's just kind of like, yeah, you know, maybe this is the year we do it. What's What's the advice that you give to them as they think that through? Yeah. So, well, first of all, uh, I, I think that there are a few, few things that you can easily do right away to kind of give, get a better sense of if it's worth doing. One is go on Apple Podcasts, go on Spotify, or just Google, see what other podcasts are already out there in your niche. And you can kind of get a sense right away, I think, of has it already been done? You know, are there already like a dozen podcasts that cover pretty much what, what you had in mind? on a podcast that could be, that could tell you like, well, okay, no, let's put our energies elsewhere. Or you could look and see, okay, well, there are a bunch of podcasts, but let's look deeper and see if we can find a niche within a niche. 
something that these podcasts aren't quite doing and that we specialize in. You know, what is our special sauce? What, what is our point of view? Why do we exist as a company? And that's a good way to kind of start building an idea for a podcast. So one is to go see what's the competition, what's already out there. Can we, do we have something to add to this ongoing conversation? And I think that can give you a pretty good idea. I think another thing to do, it's, it's also important to look within your organization and say, do we have someone here who would be a good host for the show? Because the host is absolutely key. And you're not going to be 100% sure, but a, ho a good host is someone who is a good conversationalist, has energy, uh, a good listener. You know, ultimately, you're not going to know until you try. But if you come up with a total blank, you're like, there is no one here who I would trust <laughs> to host a podcast, yeah. then that's a problem. And so that might mean, it doesn't mean you can't do a podcast, but you might need to find a host from elsewhere, you know, but that would make it harder. But on the other hand, if you do have, you're like, oh yeah, like, you know, Jane over there, she's, she would be so great at this. She has a little background in it. That's another sign that like, okay, yeah, we could maybe do pretty well with a podcast. And then I think it's worth reaching out to, you know, to, to a podcast producer, an agency, even if you don't necessarily want to work with an agency, just to get a sense of what's involved. What does it take to get a podcast up and running? If you just Google that, you'll find a lot of stuff that, in my opinion, makes it sound easier than it actually is. Stuff like, oh, just you can just record into your phone and throw it up on Anchor, which is like Spotify's free hosting platform. And uh, that's it. You got a podcast. Congratulations. It's That's not how it works. I mean, you can do that, but the podcast won't be very good. And so I think it's good to have a realistic sense of what will it take to get a podcast up and running and then to keep it going and to do it at a high level to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish with it. And by the way, another thing is right away say, what would be our goals? Why? What do we want to accomplish with this podcast? And as we've been talking about a little bit, there can be different goals. You know, one might be, well, we just want to build up an audience. We want to become the destination, the go-to source for information in our industry. Let's do it through a podcast. It might be generating content. It might be both. It might be a networking tool, right? And you also want to think about your existing marketing ecosystem. You know, what, how will a podcast play with what we're already currently doing? Do we, if you're already doing, say, like a video series or a webinar series and doing it regularly, is there a way maybe you can take that audio and repurpose it as a podcast without having to reinvent the whole thing? Maybe. It's a good idea. Talking to a seasoned podcast producer will help you answer these questions. Yep. Awesome. And it also gives you a much better idea of whether or not this is something you could try to do in-house or if you might need to hire somebody from the outside. So that's my advice. Right. Yep. All right, great. Well, Jeremy Scherer, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for our listeners and our viewers. You can, you can download the podcast just in audio format or watch it on YouTube. Um, I have one piece of homework for our listeners and viewers today, and that is to think about who might benefit from listening or watching interesting B2B marketers. So if you're, you're out there listening, think about sending the show to one or two people that you think would, uh, would enjoy the show. But uh, that's all we've got today. Thanks again to Jeremy. And thanks again for tuning in to Studio 26. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the interesting B2B Marketers podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. If you found value in today's episode, please help grow the podcast by sharing with others and leaving a review. We'll see you next time.